Welcome to the Executive Lounge, the business leadership program that brings you nuggets of insights from men and women who have scaled the daunting height of starting, managing, and growing businesses across the globe. I am Inshira Addo. I'm joined today by a woman who very early on in her life was selected as one of uh, the world young leaders to look out for by the World Economic uh, Forum. And in fact, Forbes listed her as one of 20 women of power in Africa. She currently heads Vodafone Ghana. Yolanda Kuba, you're welcome to the Executive Lounge. Thank you very much. What was it like growing up? It was uh, interesting. I mean, I come from a normal kind of childhood, um, one of four kids uh, at home, and I've got a twin sister. So uh, I always had someone to, to be in trouble with and actually go out and do silly things with. So it was always fantastic just being a twin. I hope this is Yolanda, not the twin. Yeah, we fraternal twins, so you would be able to tell. All right, that's good. <laughs> well, you are reportedly mm -hmm someone who kind of got your entrepreneurial drive from your upbringing. You had family members mm. who were running businesses on their own. Yes. How has that shaped your life and what are some of the memories from then? I think, I mean, uh, just growing up in an environment where everyone ran a business, my grandmother ran a business, my aunt ran a business, everyone, even my mom actually had her own law firm at the time. So you, you just grew up with people that, a lot of women actually, that were actually running their own businesses. So as you grow up, obviously, then you actually get the, the bug almost that says you either should be entrepreneurial or you should be really excellent at actually managing things. So I fell into being really excellent at managing things. Well, I was thinking more like you fell into getting the best of both worlds. The thing is, you, you, as, as you're growing up, you actually get a lot of the entrepreneurial kind of spirit within mm -hmm. within the family. The discussions around the table are all around how much risk taking should be done, how much uh, losses are you able to take, and so on and so on. And we've seen literally the ups and the downs of all the different businesses that the family actually was involved in. So you actually start balancing out some of your risk profile based on what, on what their experiences were. Mm. But early on, because we were forced to actually go and work uh, in, the, in the stores and in the butcheries and so on, you actually then develop the discipline that actually is required to be in a, in a, in a formal kind of environment And you well. took a shine to the computer quite early, using it to do stock taking. Yes, uh, my, uh, my uncle actually used to work for Anderson Consulting, they're now uh, um, was it? it was Arthur Anderson Consulting there, right. now it's no, Accenture. Right. Yes. Right. Accenture. Yeah, he used to be uh, a, a consultant there and he actually helped actually uh, automate the entire, the entire store, the stock taking and so on. So the inventory was actually on there and we were tasked with actually capturing that and we were handsomely rewarded mm. for, for actually doing that, that piece of work. So, yeah. All right. So mm -hmm. you learned how to do good work and get paid handsomely for it early yeah. on in life. <laughs> yes. Let's take a trip back to um, Cape Town, mm. um, Google Litu, right? Yes, yes. Uh, that brought a glint. Yeah, I'm you. shocked that you know even about Google Litu, so <laughs> that's the reason. <laughs> take, let's go back to Google Litu. Um, yes. You've seen Ghana, uh, quite a bit of Ghana. Mm. How would you describe Google Litu? Paint that picture for the Ghanaian who doesn't know where that is to, to, to appreciate. So it's a it's a it's a little township uh, that was actually developed uh, through the apartheid years to actually settle uh, black people in 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 the Western Cape, which is uh, part of South Africa. Mm -hmm. And basically, what it is, it's a lot of four bedroom houses actually in the chain, uh, but actually good infrastructure actually that they built there as well uh, as part of the apartheid government. But yeah, but basic kind of environment, but. Uh, you know, as they say, where the family is, the fun is. So no matter what their conditions were, you're always happy to be what there. What was the society like? Was it close-knit beyond your family? Yeah, I mean, uh, being there, I mean, we talk about it now, is that you knew all your neighbors. Today, where I live, I don't know all my neighbors. You know, uh, if you were out of sugar, you actually went next door and you actually knocked on the door and you said, can I please borrow some sugar uh, or borrow an onion mm -hmm. and so on. So that was part of um, sort of... We had communal living, if I can call it that. Uh, and then, you know, you ask for something, but you, you know, 
you hardly ever returned it because the neighbors will come and ask for something else. Mm. So it was sort of a way of, of, of life, but also it was, um, it was balanced life in the sense that if I didn't have today, I can count on you to help me. And if you didn't have tomorrow, you could count on me to actually be there for you. So, and that, for example, is what we've lost these so you, days. You so lived there. Ubuntu. We, we lived Ubuntu. That's, That's exactly right. what it is. Fantastic. Um, mm. You know, we all, one way or the other, mm. uh, get shaped by the collection of experiences from our childhood and mm. everything we pick up along the way. Mm. How much of your childhood has shaped Yolanda Kuba that we know now? So I, I think, I mean, one of my first real moments where I actually said, you know what, I want to actually have an impact, big impact in, in what I do, actually happened when I was still in high school. And for me, it was around my little brother actually saying to me, um, I can't, my mom, because my mom was single uh, with four kids and providing them the best schooling she could, I'm like, I can't actually have that because my, my mom is, uh, cannot afford that. And after that moment, you're like, but you, it's schoolwork. And, and, and he said, no, but it doesn't matter. I have to think about uh, the, all the other children, mm. you know? So, and for me, that was like, this is not a choice that a child should make, you know? And then my, my brother was like 10 years younger than us. So, you know, you're actually sitting there and you're like, this choice is no child should actually have to make. And for me, I remember that moment as a real defining moment where I said, actually going forward, this is what I want to actually be able to provide, to actually make enough impact to make sure that no kid in, within our family and beyond actually goes without a need. A want is something else, but a need is something that I was actually very clear about, that I want to be able to provide that. Profound. Mm. Uh, and um, I'm sure you've been able to fulfill that uh, yes, desire. Mm. Yes, I have. So let's take a quick look back at start of your career what has the journey been like it's been interesting because I started my career actually in marketing so my first year of work was actually in marketing and then I decided no this is not really where I belong and then I did a conversion course into accounting and then actually did articles and qualified as the chartered accountant and then actually went into corporate finance which is really where I cut my teeth in in the business world and then from there, it's been a journey around. It's been a, an up and up and up and up rise. And then in mm -hmm. 2014, you joined the, the Vodacom Group. Yes, I did. Uh, as an executive, I joined the Vodacom Group as a non-executive director first, mm -hmm. about a year and a half before that. And then a year later, I mean, a year and a half later, then I joined as, a, as an executive within, within the business, yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. Then we fast forward to... Roughly just a couple of weeks shy of mm. 12 months exactly, mm -hmm. um, you came to Ghana yes. as CEO of Vodafone. Yes. I know you look back at um, your last 12 months as a very interesting period, uh, but mm. for those who are not privy to that story, mm. sum up what the last 12 months has been for you. It's been a lot about learning. I think uh, one underestimates how different each African market really is. Mm. You know, we are a collection of 54 different countries with 54 diff totally different cultures, 54 different ways of doing things and so on. And we under actually estimate that, that part of our identity. Mm. So for me, that was the first sort of grounding I had to learn. So I got slept a little bit, <laughs> and like, this is Ghana, you know, and you do in Ghana as Ghanaians do. Right. So, and, and for me, that was, the, that was one of the biggest learning that I actually went through in the transitional uh, uh, period here. And then the next one was around, how do we actually uh, redefine who we want to be as Vodafone mm -hmm. within the country? And, and for me, that went through a process of actually reviewing what we've done and actually saying, what does the country need and what are we actually able to provide and how do we bridge the two together? And because I really believe in high impact and I also believe in actually inclusion and, and actually inclusive kind of development, we actually started building up a new strategy that is around exactly that and that is around igniting Ghana's digital revolution. And for us, the whole thing around igniting Ghana's digital revolution is being a bridge between the haves, the have-nots, and the almost-haves. And, and really how we think of, of ourselves is saying, we want to be the inclusive force, we want to be the glue 
that actually builds those, uh, those bridges between the people that are financially excluded from financial services today, people that, for example, are excluded from services today and so on, using digital as a platform. So how we sum it up at the office, and you'll hear people at, in Vodafone actually talking about it, is that we will leave no one digitally behind. And for us, that's something we're actually committed to. As a CEO, mm -hmm. as a s senior business executive, mm -hmm. um, learning is critical. And mm -hmm. you talked about how you've mm -hmm. learned. Uh, but the process of learning quite often is in three phases. So mm -hmm. you're either learning something new, you're mm -hmm. unlearning something old, or you're relearning something that you used to do. Mm -hmm. How much of these did you have to do? And in what aspects of your practice did you have to maybe learn, mm -hmm. relearn, or unlearn something? So I had a lot of unlearning to do. You know, one of the things that most probably people underestimate is that you get to where you are because of your technical abilities, mm. you know, and you actually assume that your technical abilities are gonna keep you at the next level and the next level above that. And in reality, when you actually come into a CEO position, especially in a new country, it's about people, you know. If you ask me what were the issues that I was dealing with uh, in my first few weeks, it wasn't people asking me what's the ARP, who was this, what's that in the market. No, it was nothing to do with them. It was about people issues. How are you going to make me feel? How are you going to make me successful? How are you going to do this? And how do you work in order for me to actually fit into how you work? And basically, it was those kind of questions. It was the anxiety of someone new actually coming in. And what does it mean for me? Although some people wouldn't necessarily put it in that way. But that's, that was the anxiety that was actually permeating in the organization. And that's what I actually had to deal with. So I, my first talk was around people. And, uh, and, I, and I remember taking out my team for a breakfast and saying, guys, you know, let's talk about what are your personal aspirations? What do you want Vodafone to help you achieve as an individual? I'm not asking about the company. Mm -hmm. I'm asking about you. What is it that you want to achieve for yourself? What mark do you want to leave in this country? How do you want to be remembered? And that was the first conversation we actually had. It wasn't about the business. And I was very clear that at the end of the day, after all the questions that I, and that I had had sort of the two weeks, for the first two weeks in the job, actually people needed their identity actually affirmed across the business and that's what I actually then went out to it. So learned a lot of new skills. Mm. Mm. You've all learned some and you learned some. Yeah. Share some with me. So I mean I'll take, give you a typical example. One of the things that I would normally do is actually walk into the boardroom and I'll rattle out a hundred different things off on my to-do list and say actually how do we actually then stack up on this? Now can't do it. You know now you, you actually have to learn to be led. You know, people always think leaders lead. We don't lead, we orchestrate. That's all we do. You know, we take that piece, take that piece, and, and say how does the combination of all actually equal to a bigger, a bigger whole. So for me, that was one of the things that actually I had to almost unlearn to say, actually, Yolanda, it's not about what you can produce, it's about what the team can actually produce. And just unlearning that, that process of unlearning was was horrific for me because I'm sort of hands-on, I want to do things and so on. So yeah, so for me that was one of the big things that I actually uh, had to unlearn. Mm -hmm. The ones that I actually had to learn, for example, is how the Ghanaian culture actually approaches a lot of things. And I'm not going to say, I'm going to apologize for the generalization first, but what I found to be a typical kind of behavior is I found a lot of people that were agreeable, you know, but agreeable doesn't mean that I agree, mm -hmm. you know. So, and, and for me, that was a, there was a disconnect, you know, in when you, you're agreeable. You probably took agreeability agreeable to be acceptance. Yes, you know, so, <laughs> so, so, uh, I'm, so I, I, again, I got a little bit of, you know, the, one, a few of those in my time. And okay. then I learned, and like, okay, there's a way in which you actually um, get to the process of agreeing. To something and then actually accepting the outcome for everyone and then moving forward as a team on, on those kind of issues. So yeah, it's been, it's been a mixed bag for me, but it's been a good journey though. Well, I could tell and mm. uh, we are learning quite a lot about that now mm. here on the Executive Lounge. We're going to take a short break and when we come back, we'll continue to learn some more from uh, Yolanda Kuba, who is the CEO of Vodafone Ghana. This is the Executive Lounge with me and Shirado. Stay tuned, we'll be back.
Welcome back to the Executive Lounge and today we're hanging with the CEO of Vodafone Ghana, Yolanda Kuba, and she's taught us quite a few things from our own experiences. The fact that she's had to learn that the Ghanaian may be agreeable but not always accepting and uh, that's some more insights coming up in a moment. Uh, you talked about Vodafone starting a digital revolution. Mm. Paint that imagery for me. What does that mean to me, the Ghanaian? It means that from a Vodafone perspective, we want to be part of actually moving Ghana forward. Mm -hmm. um, and what does that look like? It looks like a connected child. It looks like basically when, I, when I'm born, I'm registered. I've got an identity that actually works. And then when I go to school, I'm able to get, for example, we've got instant school where I'm able to get textbooks. I'm able to get material that are in the textbook, that are in question papers from everywhere around the world, from libraries around the world without actually leaving my home. Mm. Okay. It means that when I grow up and I want to know what to study and, and do whatever I want to do, I've got the ability to do so. I can learn e-coding, I can learn everything that I want, and I can start building my own solutions myself. In fact, a week ago we spoke about at the CEO forum where I said, actually what is for me a, a great vision is how do we include the youth to be part of creating solutions mm. rather than just being consumers. And for me, that's something that is about that ignition of that digital revolution. Remember, when we have more people participating in the economy, the economy actually also grows quite exponentially. So that's what we need to actually create. How do we actually give that extra vim to the entire organization that is called Ghana to actually go forward and be able to have connected cities where we're able to actually deliver our services more on, on digital, that manual, where we actually eliminate some of the wastage in the system and so on. I mean, when we apply some of our solutions to ourselves in our businesses, mm -hmm. we actually can see the waste lim uh, elimination process actually. And we also are going out there and we're actually selling some of these solutions to businesses. And the businesses are actually deriving uh, benefit where we actually offer platforms where we actually we meet, get the farmer at the one end and a uh, manufacturer on the other end, like a Nestle or any other one of those, and saying, how do we actually streamline the process, but also make sure that you're able to identify what, where your inputs are coming from, you are improving the yield for that, those farmers and so on, and moving all that process all the way to, to the manufacturer as well. So how do we create that ecosystem that allows all of that to actually flourish? You're very big on innovation as a person, mm -hmm. and so is the culture at Vodafone. Mm -hmm. So um, as a, an end user, mm -hmm. I can expect a double whammy. <laughs> what are some of the cool things that you think you have done to distinguish the Vodafone brand mm -hmm. in the industry? So one of the big things that we've done in just the last few weeks uh, is actually launch of what we call Supercare. Uh, Vodafone Supercare, where we actually went out and said there are a class of people, a group of people in the country that are actually excluded and how do we build that bridge and what we actually ended up with is is a product where we're able to service today people that are both uh, uh, speech and, and uh, hearing impaired mm. through video and everyone in the organization is actually learning sign language wow. right now, including myself, yeah. <laughs> you know, where we're able to actually now service uh, those individuals. That's the first part. But the second part that we actually all underestimated previously is the cost of data for them because they need to see someone or they need to text someone. So you go to your uh, to use your data firstly for Facebook and all that. So it's, it's something you can live without if you had to. Okay, you're a journalist, but probably not. But <laughs> most people can live without when, right. truth be, when truth be told. However, on, on, in their, on their side, it's something they cannot live without because that's their basic communication tool. So what we've done even on that, we've actually reduced the cost of actually them communicating and giving them the their, their ability to communicate daily, weekly, and monthly in packages that actually make sense to them, giving them lots of data, giving lo lots of SMS as part of the value bundle that we actually so give like to them. So that's like technology, you know, bringing about uh, inclusiveness. Yes, absolutely. And uh, as this part of the Vodafone revolution, the, the digital revolution. Absolutely. It's, so it's bang in the middle of what we're trying to do. Remember, as I said, we're trying to leave no one behind digitally. That, that means that we're saying, if bricks and mortar can't do it, okay, don't worry about it. 
we will actually step in and actually make sure that everyone is included. So we're doing that with, for example, marginalized communities or so on. We're doing it with education where we're actually bringing in instant schools where a child from uh, a phone can actually learn the content uh, of, uh, of their textbooks and so on. And if you're a Vodafone customer, you actually are able to use that for free. You can download the data for free and so on. If you're on other networks, you actually have to pay the data charges from that network, but you have access to the content for free. So, we're so you're not restricting we're not access restricting, to it to... We're not restricting access to this, to, to only Vodafone. So, um, in fact, uh, on Supercare, which is the hearing impaired uh, initiative, the other day we actually got a request from someone who actually said, I want to talk to, to my doctor. But my, and, and you, you as Vodafone, and it's only been a few weeks, you as Vodafone, are able to actually communicate with me? Are you able to help me communicate with the person that I need to communicate with? So now all of a sudden, it's not just about providing you a service as a Vodacom, a Vodafone customer, but it actually is about actually providing a social good as well. So that for me is around inclusion. And also how do we think about development as well? In the last few weeks, we will actually also launch a product called Vim. And that for us was in a response to a social need and the social need was around uh, underemployment and, under, and, and unemployment of especially the youth uh, kind of sector in, in segment in the population. Mm -hmm. And what that seeks to do is basically give artisanal kind of training uh, in beauty, in catering, in uh, uh, shirt making, and all those kind of uh, artisanal kind of capabilities to young people. In, and if they are committed to it, they end up with a, a school where they can do certificated programs and where we actually sponsor that. And that's through just joining them. And that's all around saying there is enough young people that are underemployed that we need to make a difference to today in order to, for Ghana to have a better tomorrow. So for me, those are the kind of things that we're actually doing as a business to make sure that we're putting our social purpose, our business purpose into our business model, to the core of our business model. Fantastic stuff, especially mm. when you look at how you're using technology to mm. reach people who were uh, would have been underserved. Um, you know, uh, only mm. recently we've started hearing or seeing buildings have mm. disab disability uh, access yeah. and things mm. like that. So we're evolving slowly. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, well done to you. This is like a really uh, novel um, uh, mm. idea. Through initiatives like Supercare, mm. you're using technology to mm. enable people to live pretty much normal lives, yes. you know, which hitherto would not have been possible. How important is technology um, for an economy like Ghana in terms of development and the potential for us to leapfrog some other economies that have gone ahead of us? I think it is absolutely crucial. You know, um, what we've looked at technology as previously is around automation. You know, take a manual process and then just automate it. That's, that's how we've looked at technology for a long time. Now we're actually looking at it and saying, how can the intelligence in, the, in, in technology actually leap progress forward? There are many uh, uh, applications for, for that to happen. It happens in financial services, it happens in manufacturing, it happens in telecoms. You know, so as I said, we use some of, the, of our own solutions. What does then that generate? It generates new areas of revenue generation. Mm. You know, I mean, let's say 10 years ago, uh, the US didn't even know that you can actually get as much money as they do from Google today or from Facebook today. And that's all new. That's all new revenue sources, new capabilities that we're actually building across. And in Ghana, we're no different. I mean, when you actually start looking deeper into, into Ghana, you look at the, some of the app developers in the country. You know, there's so many of them. There are so many of them. We're starting to use them because obviously now we're specifically looking at those individuals and saying, how do we embed some of their solutions in what we do so that their businesses can also be uh, sustainable? We're opening up what we call APIs. So we actually open up our own infrastructure for third parties to actually connect to them so that they can generate new revenues for themselves so that they can actually have a sustainable uh, future as well. What does that do? It actually creates a new ecosystem within the country where we're able to actually attract new skills as well. So. Um, 
all the stuff around, you know, people talk about technology, digitization. Look at Safaricom, for example, which is a sister company mm -hmm. with Vodafone here in, in Kenya. You know, I mean, they can calculate the impact that their business around financial inclusion actually has on, on, the, on the GDP of the country. So they say they actually contribute somewhere around 2% or so of the, of, the, of the revenue generation in the country. So financial inclusion is a big part of inclusion where people actually didn't know that they could have access to credit. Mm -hmm. Now they can. You know, they didn't have the track record through actually having a Vodafone cash account. We can now say no, but this person normally actually deposits money every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. So bank, can you actually give a micro loan to this person so that they can grow their business? That person might be someone in fashion and they need to buy fabric or, or expand their current mm -hmm. business. So mechanics are your typical example. They, are, they don't necessarily actually get credit on a normal day, but all of a sudden because of what's happening within that financial inclusion space, they're able to actually get uh, access to credit and they're able to grow their businesses. So how we actually almost have a coordinated approach mm -hmm. around financial services uh, and financial inclusion and also how we actually have an entire strategy around the digitization of the entire Ghana, I think will actually go in a long way. I mean, I'll give you a typical example of some of the things that I've seen between here, for example, and where I come from. Um, the lack of uh, uh, home ownership, mm -hmm. as uh, financing for home ownership, you know, I was 21 or 22 when I owned, first, uh, owned my first home. But that was because I had an identity that was actually, you could trace back to one person. It was one identity. And secondly, it was because I had a physical address that everyone can trace me to. And I had someone who, I, who could verify who I was. Mm. Those are the three elements. And then I had, a, I had an income which was, uh, which, which was predictable, obviously, you need that. But those are the four elements. Out of those four elements, as Ghana, we only have two. So that on its own actually limits the kind of, uh, of growth that you're actually seeing. When someone has a home, they all of a sudden can get loans for their kids to go to the best schools. Mm -hmm. They all of a sudden can get loans to actually start businesses and so on. So the ripple effect of home ownership is actually quite huge on the economy. So for me, those are the kind of things that we should be looking at as a, as a, as a country. And mm. technology does have a role to play in this. Absolutely. If I'm, as I said, if I'm able to show you that I've got predictable income, which normally you wouldn't see. Imagine if I was just in a cash economy. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't see how much I'm making when the money comes in and so on. So if you're a bank and you can't see that. It's very difficult to make a decision on that. Yeah. So I can't actually, you can't have a scorecard. Right now, I'm allowing banks to have scorecards on people if they actually want it. So essentially, mm. what would have seemed like disruption actually mm. is a blessing. Absolutely. What kind of mindset is required to be able to look at new tech and accept that it's here to stay, one, mm. but more importantly, that it actually can spike the kind of growth that we've been desiring for a while? So I think the first one is you have to be open-minded to the fact that the world is moving. Mm. You know, somehow there are times when we want to like keep the world as it is. It, it is, that world is gone. There have been structural changes in the economies in, which, in where we are. Mm -hmm. Do we think oil is gonna go back anytime soon to a hundred dollars? Not anytime soon. So all the things that we used as, as the building blocks to our economy, some of them have been fundamentally actually reshaped. Mm -hmm. So we need to go find those new ways of actually doing things. So have we accepted it first? I don't think we all have, to be honest and we need to actually accept it. No. Secondly, we actually have to go out there and say who, who is best in the world at doing some of the things that we actually want to achieve. So for me, you know, uh, my typical example I, give in, I gave in the, in the last few days to someone was uh, national identity, for example. Do we have to go for the most expensive national identity solution and so on and so on, when India has the cheap, one of the cheapest solutions and they have almost a billion people or so. So, and I'm like, Let's go there and let's go see what they've done. So it's not and so then much, coming. it's just about what works. What works, and what works. So where Around people have comparative advantage, you tap into that. You tap into and that and you, say, you bring it home. And, and then you say, how do I actually make the best version of this? The people that are going to win in the future are not necessarily the inventors. 
the era of the big inventors, I think, have, has come but now, and, and has gone, to be honest. Um, but the real era that we're in now is people who are going to be strategic and say, how do I build on onto something that someone else actually has built? Or how do I make sure that what I'm doing starts off with internet-based solutions mm. as a solution? So I don't start off, for example, with saying, um, my, my, uh, my facility or my building is too full, now I need to build another one. You know, how do I start off with the thinking that says, if I was in an internet-based kind of space, I don't need to build a new school because my, my school is full. I need to build another server in order to be able to service more people across the country rather than only servicing people only in Accra. You know, so all of a sudden you're actually looking at the democratization of services you know, across, the, uh, across the, 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 the country. It seems like, so at the turn of every challenge in business, mm. technology provides us a big window to get out yes. and, and, and also to even scale up while mm. we do that. Yes. Uh, because the analogy of a building mm. being too full mm. uh, probably now requires that we're constantly being innovative in the way we work that you're looking at what you're doing okay. and saying, okay, so who can I take out of this physical space and still get the output, output. that you provide? Yes, absolutely. Brilliant stuff. We're going to take a break in a moment, but before mm. we take that break and, 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 and on the flip side of that break, we will be talking the philosophy of Yolanda Kuba. You know, I just really try and learn a few things about that. But financial inclusion is a very big deal. Um, the numbers indicated more than a thousand percent jump um, over a period of about a year and a half and is set to go even higher. Are we ready for that digital revolution as Ghanaians considering that we have more than 27 million subscribers but we have about 12 million less than half of that subscribing to um, the digital platform, uh, financial mm. platform. Mm. Absolutely, we're ready. Absolutely, we're ready. I mean, the, the demand for financial inclusion, you know, I mean, as you were saying, the growth in float that is sitting now mm -hmm. with, uh, with the mobile operators has grown by more than a thousand percent. You know, and for me, when I look at the number of people that are actually joining uh, um, Vodafone Cash or the other mobile uh, cash services, I'm actually astounded, to be honest. Because people are saying, we've always had this demand. I want to be able to sit at home and be able to transact. I want to be able to sit at home and not have to walk out in order to buy electricity. Mm -hmm. I can do it on my phone. Convenience is what is driving this behavior. It's not us actually driving it. It's people saying, actually, we are hungry for it. And that attraction is what is making us actually better at what we do. Fantastic stuff. We're going to take that break now. And when we come back, uh, we'll be learning some philosophy from Yolanda Kuba. This is the Executive Lounge. I'm in Shirado, and we're back after this. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge. And today we have on the show the CEO of Vodafone Ghana, Yolanda Kuba. Yolanda, before we went off for that break, I promised our audience that we were going to get into your philosophical mind for a bit. Now, at what point do you pinch yourself and say, you know, well, I may be a female, but I'm the boss of Vodafone Ghana and I am powerful, I am influential, uh, but balance that with the grace with which you work. I'm not sure at which point do you actually do that. I think uh, you live in your own body. So you actually don't see the successes as other people that actually see it. You know, uh, the fortunate part about being a twin is that when something happens to me that's great, my sister actually jumps on the bed and does everything and celebrates on my behalf. And when something bad happens, she cries more than I do. So from that perspective, that's how I see my reality, you know, uh, through, a, through a second person. But you live in your own body. So every day, you're actually trying to improve on the day before. And that's basically how I live my life. It's how do I become better than the person that I was yesterday? How do I impact the world in a better way than I did uh, the previous day, the previous year, and, and everything like that? Yeah. In the corporate world, there's mm. always the talk of this glass ceiling. Mm. You broke through that. 
there must have been some pushbacks along the way. How did you keep telling yourself, I'm going to break this thing mm -hmm. and I'm going to create a new world for me? So, I mean, I think firstly, being in an environment uh, as young, uh, when I was really young, that actually had a lot of women that uh, had their own businesses running their own things, including my mother with her own law firm and so on. It made it easier for me to believe that I could be anything that I wanted to become. So for me, that was the first kind of barrier that I actually had to, mm -hmm. to, to actually get through, is, is just believing in it. And I remember when I was like 29 years old and became a CEO of a JSE listed company, mm -hmm. and you sat there and the people were writing all sorts of things about you, how young you are, it's impossible, and so on and so on. And I remember doing an interview with uh, Rene from Financial Mail at the time, and, and I said to her, you know, there's nothing I can do about the person who wrote that article. But what I can tell you, it is impossible for them, not necessarily for me. So right now, I'm giving myself the best chance to actually do this thing, and I'm going to succeed at it. And, and that's the attitude that I approach a lot of things that I do. Mm, interesting. Mm. So it's not about um, just the proverbial, I am the female and I have to you know, uh, work my way up. You decided mm -hmm. right early on in life that if other women around you mm -hmm. can do it, yeah. then you can. So how important is it to keep the environment that enables people to, mm -hmm. to be successful? And, mm -hmm. and, and by that, mm -hmm. let's look at the energetic uh, team at Vodafone mm -hmm. Ghana. I mean, mm -hmm. how are you able to keep them happy and consistently pushing behind the vision? I think firstly, I mean, you, you actually have to come to the team and say, guys, what, why are we here? Why are we here? Why do we do the things that we do? Why do we spend more than half of our lives in this building? You know, why are we doing it? And once you actually get to the why, it then becomes easier for people to actually believe in the story. And how we actually sat down and came up with the, our vision around igniting Ghana's digital revolution. Mm -hmm. That process actually included everyone, and everyone had an input into it and saying, how do we make ourselves the best technology company that will ignite this, this revolution? How do we make sure that we leave no one behind in our, in our quest for this? And the questions that come up is amazing. Like, but we only can touch people that are on our network. And, and someone else says, no, you know, digital means that we can touch everyone. It doesn't mean that it's only people on our network. So how do we drive that? So the conversations and so on that you actually build around the team in order to actually keep their momentum, their own aspirations into the mix of what you're trying to actually put together as a vision is a collective one. And therefore it's much easier to actually motivate someone who, is actually, who has a stake in what is on the table to say, actually, for me to actually succeed, I must make sure that this vision actually succeeds. And every day we talk about it. We talk about, for example, today, and as I was saying, that we had some of uh, the people that are, are speech impaired actually walking into our building right. and actually being part of the of of, um, of some of the programs that we're actually doing. They're, they're training our people. So all of a sudden, we're opening a new world for them. And it's my people, not me, that's coming up with the ideas on how to actually do these things. You know, uh, there was an idea around, for example, on VIM. How do we sustainably include some of the people that go through our VIM program uh, or VIM per position mm -hmm. and actually get qualifications? How do we get them sustainably into our supply chain? So those ideas that are coming through my people, not me. So for me, those are the kind of stuff. How do you keep on making sure that the energy and the drive actually is consistent over time for, for everyone in, in the business? You're very this is for them, their own vision. Mm. Remember the first conversation we had. I sat down and I said, what is your own vision for yourself? Yes. And what is the impact that you want to have? Yes. And then actually transporting them afterwards to the business. So there is a part of this that is also about them as individuals as well. So finding that point of convergence in their own aspirations and the businesses is, yes. is critical. Now, you're crazy about young people and, and, and you know the youth empowerment and yes. all of that. Yes. I think helping us understand where that emanates from would be a great idea. But what do you mm. see mm. in the youth and why is that there's such an urgency mm. to impact positively on, on, on youth lives? So, I mean, if I start with the end part of your question, um, the youth is the biggest part of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and it's going to keep on growing. And there are very few countries that you, where you're seeing that there are systematic programs 
that are able to actually address the youth mm -hmm. and the future of the youth. And for me, you know, having worked very young, I started formal work at 21 and actually seen how I've progressed through, through, uh, through the corporate ladder and being a young CEO and so on and so on, actually has led me to believe that my biggest constraint was not that I was a woman. It was that you're too young to be around this boardroom. So, and, and if I can somehow change the mindset around people are not too young to be around the boardroom, it's about the contribution they make. Measure me according to contribution, don't measure me according to my age, mm. was a big thing uh, for me in the back of my mind. And I said, how do I systematically actually move people from looking at my age? I wanted people to forget about my age and actually start talking about what I was contributing. Finally, it did happen and I was really grateful, but it took, it took some time. People can't ignore that you are 40 years their, their junior when they walk into a boardroom of a bank. Mm -hmm. You know, today I'm the longest serving board member on Barclays Africa Group, which also owns uh, Barclays in, in Ghana. That's right. You know, so, I mean, if you are the youngest person there, but you're the longest serving member at 11 years, <laughs> you know, it tells you how young I was right. when I actually walked into that boardroom for the first time. I couldn't have expected everyone to take me seriously on the first day. But today, everyone does. And, and for me, it's a journey. And how Africa deals with its young people is just going to be a thing that we actually are going to have to watch in 15, 18 years from now, when we don't have enough money to actually pay social grants because the youth are underemployed or unemployed mm -hmm. today and they still have to support the social structure that is there that is getting older. Mm -hmm. What is gonna happen? And for me, those are the future questions that we're not dealing with today that will actually determine what actually happens to Africa in the next 15, 20 years. Now this dovetails nicely into uh, an interesting part of your mm -hmm. own story. Mm -hmm. As a child, you had lots of examples of entrepreneurial, um, mm. you know, uh, en endeavors around you. And then you grew up and mm. you were at some point mentored. Now, mm. who chose who? Did you choose the mentor or the mentor spotted you and said, oh, that's a bright spark I'd like to, you know, you know light up? So I, I always tell people, the, for mentors, you choose your mentors. But more importantly, it's your sponsors. There's the mentorship part and then there's a sponsor. And for me, I was lucky enough mm. to have lots of sponsors early on in my career. I, I chose them. You know, uh, I had the governor of the Reserve Bank of South Africa as my mentor, Joe Marcus. I had the CEO and chairman of uh, Woolworths being my, my sponsor as well. So I've had really great people actually being around me. My ex-chairman, Tokyo Sekhwale, was, uh, was, my, was my sponsor too. So for me, I've had lots of people around me that actually were willing to invest in me. And people often ask me, what's the difference between a mentor and, and, a, and a sponsor? Mm -hmm. And the biggest difference that I see is that a sponsor is someone who is interested in you as you, first and foremost, and nothing else. So in places where you would not even feature in, in conversation, they will put you there. So for me, the kind of people that, uh, the kind of things that people used to do for me, I'm still sort of taken aback by, I'm flabbergasted. It, like, did you really do that for me? Some, sometimes they wouldn't even tell you the kind of things that they, they, they've done for you. So for me, I mean, for example, I, the, uh, Simon Sassman, who's the uh, chairman of Woolworths in, in, in SA, uh, used to fly to Johannesburg. He lived in Cape Town, being John, and he would fly to Johannesburg and say, Elanda, I'm coming to see you. You know, and one of the fundamental things that Simon once told me, he said, and it was, uh, was probably around 2010, 2011, uh, and so I had been CEO since 2007 and so on. And he said, Yolanda, anyone can be a shooting star, but what's going to make you sustainable? Mm. You know, and I remember actually sitting with this question and saying, actually, anyone can get an A. We've heard this before, but how do you sustain an A? at school, you know, and you've heard this, but when he put it like that, I was like, actually, you're right. What is going to make me sustainable? And I had to change course. I had to change from what I was doing and say, actually, and now I'm going in this direction because I think this is what is going to make me sustainable. And I started talking about repeatable models of success. Mm -hmm. And I said, I want to be in a company that can teach me that and so on. I want to spend three years with that company. And I ended up at SAB Miller in South Africa because they had been able to build a global empire to number two in the world mm -hmm. from South Africa. You know, so for me, and they had done it time and time again. 
and and just actually going through the process of reflection actually forced me to actually get there so they are personally interested in your outcomes they are the ones that call you and say actually Yolanda I think you're going in the wrong direction here and that's important They're that's like the important. rudder on the ship that guides it to its mm. destination mm. you once quoted a saying that we live life in thirds yes one third is to learn mm. the other third is to earn and the other third is to give back yes. how much of that do you live by the way, that I actually got from one of my sponsors too. And yeah, so it's interesting how much you actually pick up from your sponsors. I love that fully. I, mean, uh, I, I genuinely believe that everyone, you know, you're born and whatever, you have to learn a lot of things. Whatever your third is, just spend the time actually learning. Some people it's 20 years, some people it's 30 years, some people it's 40 years, that's fine. That's your lot in life, whichever, whichever uh, way you're doing. The next one is to earn. I do not believe that people who do not have money can give. If you don't feel like you've ever had money, don't force people to then give when they are not ready to give. People that are giving abundantly, the people like Bill Gates, they've had the opportunity to earn. They've had the opportunity to say, this is mine. And that's why it's easier to actually give it away. So for me, that's important that people should be given the, the ability to earn. And you know, in an African context, mm -hmm. and I must bring this home, you know, uh, is that where, as soon as you start working, you have a hundred people that you have to feed. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden someone says, but I don't have enough money for myself. I can't buy a car. I have to actually uh, uh, take a taxi to, to work. I can't be productive in this. I can't do that. Give your children a chance to actually build themselves up. You know, once they've built themselves up, they will surprise you to the upside. And I was lucky enough to be in a family where that was allowed. My mom would be very clear, says, Yolanda, I want nothing from you. When you are done doing you, come back and you can give me anything that you want. You know? And for me, that's important, that ability to actually earn and actually make something for yourself first. And then the third element is then around giving back. Giving back, I firmly believe in. I believe uh, I've got a foundation in SA that actually deals with education. I really believe that education is a key to unlocking the potential that there is. It is a key to actually making sure that we eliminate poverty as well. So that for me is really important, especially of girl children. Girl children are my pet kind of project and mm -hmm. I, I'm always actually talking to girl children and doing things with girl children as well. Um, and secondly, I do a lot of things around mentorship just in general. Children in high school, university, and also young professionals as well, just to give them the encouragement to say, actually, there are people ahead of you that have done this. Don't go through the same mistakes that I've gone through. Mm -hmm. Yes, you will have your own, but don't make them the same ones yeah. as mine. Accelerate your path because I had been there before you. And there are people in front of me that actually have paved the way. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to accelerate because they were there. So for me, that sort of uh, virtuous cycle around that is really important that we actually establish as well. Great stuff. Mm. As we wrap up, mm. I'm sure it's not all work for you. Uh, what do you do to relax? <laughs> What do I do to relax? I've got two children that keep me busy. Okay. So that is my relaxation because they come up with the weirdest and wonderful things. But I also um, love dancing. I, uh, until I came here, I used to do ballroom and Latin American dancing, and I used to do it competitively as well. Wow. So that was my like, fun pastime. I've been doing it since I was eight years old. So yeah, I love it. Okay. Well, you do spend a bit of time on the golf course. Well as of a few weeks ago. Yes. Okay, how's that coming yeah. along? That, that actually went on off very well. I, I hit the first ball, which was the most important mm -hmm. thing. So yeah, um, I practice <laughs> for a couple of weeks in order to make sure that I actually don't miss that first ball. So yeah, that was really good. Uh, the Asante Hini Golf uh, Open was really, really good. Fantastic. Uh, we enjoyed that. Okay. Well, and uh, I must say that it's been fun um, talking to you on the Executive Lounge. We have a tradition on the show that before I sign off, I share with you five things I have learned from talking to Yolanda. Now, I'm going to start with the very last one first, which is just be a bundle of energy. 
uh, and, and positivity. And that's the one thing that you, you get, that you should never look at the things in front of you and decide that because of where I'm coming from or who I am, I'm not going to be able to surpass that. She decided that she was not going to be let down uh, or, or be hindered by the fact that she is a female and she's broken through uh, as one of the youngest CEOs. And you too can do that. The other thing that I have learned today is this, that surround yourself with the right people, people who are genuinely interested in you and take their word. When people do stuff for you, be genuinely happy about them. And when you also get out there, set goals, important, set goals. And she talks about how she wanted to change her cause and so she chose an organization that had repeatedly shown success and she did that. So you set goals and you go after them. And then, one of the very early things we learned in this conversation was that when you go into a new situation, be willing to learn. And learning is sometimes about unlearning some of the things that you have learned in the past and also relearning some things you've forgotten. More importantly, consistently learning and adapting to the environment that you are. The things you know, your own status quo can never remain the status quo of the world. And finally, no matter what you do, it's important to dream and have people around you who share in that dream. So sell the dream to them, sell it with a lot of passion and enthusiasm, and hopefully they'll buy into it like her team has. It's been a great time having you on the Executive Lounge. Thank you, Yolanda Kuba. Thank you, we'll see you soon. Thank you. We're back next week with more. My name is Inshira Addo, and as always, go forward, make rain, shalom. <laughs>